We thank Alejandro and Fernando for this success case. And now we'll go on with Timothy Winters in a QA cafe. And he's going to give the, he's going to speak of RIPE as. Hi, everyone. I'm here today to talk about um, the transition from RIPE 554 to the new document, RIPE 772, and talk about how we got here, the purpose of these documents, and how people can use them um, to better help in the deployment of IPv6. So, the authors, you know, who, who wrote these documents, and here we have all the different authors and where they got involved at different times. So, um, we have various various authors that come from various places, which is good because it led, led to you know improving the document in a variety of ways. So first off, what was RIPE 554? It was a guidance for procurement of equipment, of IPv6 equipment, um, and in particular for helping them buying for enterprises, enterprise-like environment. Um, it comes out of the RIPE IPv6 working group. It, it was very successful. A lot of different groups, um, governments and enterprises both use the document um, to help them procure and make sure that things that they're buying will support um, IPv6. Um, we've also had heard from several companies that they use it um, in a method, in a way to help them build their roadmaps. So all of that was really, really good. Um, just a little bit of history on it. It started with a, uh, the Slovenian government was trying to figure out how to purchase V6 things and they, they didn't understand and they went to um, one of our authors, Jan in particular, and said, hey, you know, can you help us write this up? So he sat down, talked about it and worked with a couple of other members of the right community and came up with a document that he wrote for them to kind of help. Um, that start was the start of that document. That's right, 5501. And then we took that document and we made it um, right 554. So here you can see it went out. You know, the big thing to note here is it was adopted within two months. People really wanted this in particular, you know, helping them figure out what features should be in an IPv6 document. The one thing I want to highlight here is, you know, it might get superseded in the future as, it, as, uh, as things went along. And so that's where we kind of kicked off this process in the last year, 18 months, really. So the first update we did from 501 to 554 was really taking it, you know, updating the language, um, you know, translation from Slovenian to English and making some other updates. It took a while. There was a lot of review of that document. Um, as you can see, there were lots of contributors to that document. So that document came out in June of 2012. Um, at the, that's what we're ripe. If you've seen ripe 554, it's been out since June 2012. So it's it's been almost almost 10 years. Wow almost 10 years since that document was out. Um, its main contents include all of these requirements I'm listing here, you know, networks are pretty diverse. We tried to cover requirements for many of the pieces of equipment that might be in a network that range from hosts to home gateways to mobile devices, load balancers. And we touch on some subjects and I say touch because we can't cover them all as, you know, IPv6 support and software and in particular network security devices. So those are some of the um, areas that this document covered. So since June of 2012, we've discussed many times how and when was the right time to update the document. Um, there was a little bit of fear that we had to work through about changing the document number because a lot of um, RFPs, procurement documentation pointed to write 554. In the end, we decided, you know, it was time. It had been plenty of time that we should update the document. So this is the, you know, the change stuff that we wanted to talk about today. Um, you know, things, questions that we asked ourselves when we worked with the working group was, you know, should we categories, should we change from the original ones that we put in there? Do we need to go into more detail? What are the changes? Um, in the end, what we decided was we wanted to do updates that have happened in the last 10 years and kind of stick to basic updates and not get too um, creative with the document. Maybe some, some, some others will want to do that, but we really just wanted to update it and clean it up. So. The basic changes that we made in the document were we updated a lot of the RSC references over 10 years. There have been some changes in IPv6, and we wanted to make sure we picked up the good ones. Um, IPv6 had moved to an internet standard was one of the impetus of, for this, so we wanted to make sure we get those references. Um, there was a couple of odd fundamental RFCs missing that we added in. Um, things like IPv6 over Ethernet wasn't in the original, so we added that. 
Um, we removed some references to secure protocols that never ended up being used. Um, those are kind of the things that we, the high level changes we made. Um, up some more slides that talk about the individual highlights. So earlier I mentioned categories of devices. So in this case, I'm gonna go through each category and just talk about some of the things we changed. Um, for host, we added, we cleaned up the security is really what we did. We took the IPv6 standard updates and uh, added some of the requirements that have been in there. We also added uh, DNS in router advertisements as something that we thought was mandatory in a host that they should be able to process those. Um, we had some older stuff that was in there from a mobile IPv6 that we moved to a much more optional state. Um, it's just not widely implemented. Um, we did some good stuff for enterprises and ISP switch. We added some mandatory relay options that most enterprises use. Um, other than that, it was pretty minor cleanup for the switches. Um, for routers, you know, this is the other side host. We said have to process it. Routers should be able to send RAs with DNS. Um, we also, there was some good IETF documentation around uh, routers that were forcing slash 64 boundaries. So we, we, we put that text in there saying, hey, these are things you should look for if you're a service provider and enterprise, you wanna make sure. And one of the things I wanna talk about all these details, you don't have to know them all. Um, by using this document, we try to make it easier. So you can just say, hey, I want the right 554, or in this case, sorry, the right 772. Right, 772, use that document and say, I want a router that complies with that. And all of this has been talked about and thought about that we think are important things. Um, CPEs, so this is the home gateway market. We uh, upped the security, the simple security capabilities. And we said, hey, every, if you're gonna have these six on by default, you should also have all the simple security. Um, it doesn't cover every case, but at least it, it'll make users have a much more secure and better experience. Um, Mobile devices, this was one of the sections that we removed because um, I think that it, there's a lot better specifications coming out of organizations that have worked really hard on things like 4G and 5G that have a lot more to say about this. So we took out this whole section, really talking about mobile devices from a Wi-Fi scenario. Um, and since the 3GTP standards are out of spec, we just kind of took this whole section out. Um, load balancers, we made a small update here for switching it to standard forwarding software. We expanded a lot. We've learned a lot over 10 years. So there's a lot more um, commentary of things you should look into, things, you know, resolving quad A's. You should use V6 sockets when possible. Um, when connecting, you should use default address selection or happy eyeballs too. Um, those are common practices that application developers should be doing. Like I said, um, this is a list it's not exhausted there's lots of things in the software case but I, I think we've definitely got people at least someplace to start when we wrote this document we were really trying to help out um, people to to get a starting point on the software side of things so the really important part of this is there's a new document that's available um, we want everyone to kind of move towards adopting that in the past if you've used right 554 as a procurement document um, if you're an ISP or you're an enterprise and you're using it for that, we want you to switch to RIPE 772. Um, the updates we consider minor, but also vital. A lot of those updates I talked about today were very security based. And we wanna make sure that we have um, all of those updated and ready to go. So please you know, update your references to use RIPE 772. If you aren't using it and you're trying to figure out how you get B6 into products that you're purchasing, you know, we strongly recommend you use this document. It does a really good job of uh, making it easy so you can say, hey, I want to host and I want to write 772. I don't need special things, um, just a generic one, making sure that it'll work on a V6 network, that it'll be secure on a V6 network, that you can address it. All of those things are covered by this um, document. You can manage it, you can address it, all of that connecting over V6. Um, in particular, this document takes into consideration um, V6 only networks, as we started to see a little bit more of those over time. For a long time, everything was dual stack. We're now starting to see V6 only networks. Um, so I, I think that's another thing this document takes into consideration and says, hey, these are the things you're going to need to do to function in a V6 only network. So I wanted to thank everyone for their time today, and I'd love to take some questions.
Hola, hola. Bueno, ahí estamos. Here we are. So with us today for this presentation, we have Asael Fernandez, who is also involved in what Timothy said. So we have the two of them, just in case you have any questions here in the room. Please, if you have any questions, come close to the mic, but we don't have any in the Q&A panel at Zoom. We can wait for one more minute. Apparently, there are no questions, so thank you.